Hey everybody, it's me Jack, and I'm back with my Star Wars reviews with a review of the third and final film in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Even if the month of May is done right now, I might as well continue my Star Wars reviews through the month of June. Now we're going to talk about the final film in the much despised Star Wars prequel trilogy. After being disappointed twice with both Attack of the Clones and The Phantom Menace, Star Wars fans had very little interested in seeing this last film. But when the film came out, it was actually a surprising improvement over its predecessors. It still had a lot of the typical Star Wars prequel problems, but it also had some good stuff that propelled it much higher than the other films. The story of the film takes place during the end of the Clone Wars. Anakin Skywalker is becoming a pretty powerful Jedi Knight, but unfortunately his now wife, Padme, is pregnant. Not only that, he starts to have visions of her dying. He becomes scared, but then comes across Chancellor Palpatine, who slowly starts manipulating him to the dark side, telling him that apparently a Sith Lord has the power to save the ones that they love from death. This was the one that eventually showed Anakin's final transformation into Darth Vader. Parts of it were executed very well, others not so much. Let's start with the stuff that it did well. Firstly, Anakin. Yes, for the first half of this film, Anakin Skywalker is actually a pretty well-written character. Okay, he still has some bad dialogue, but he's actually likable this time around. Yeah, they actually did a good job of making his character much more likable. The opening scene of this film alone does a better job of showing Anakin's good side and his friendship with Obi-Wan than the entirety of the last film. You could tell that he and Obi-Wan have a lot of respect for one another. Both of them want the other to get a lot of credit for the good stuff that they do. He also really cares about Padme and doesn't want her to die. Unfortunately, the dialogue is just as awful as ever between them. There's at least a good side to Anakin that, for the most part, was absent in Attack of the Clones. Obi-Wan Kenobi is also really good. Ewan McGregor did a fantastic job here. Again, he did a really good job of selling the friendship between Anakin Anakin and Obi-Wan. And the moment when they do eventually become enemies, I actually did feel sad. Even after all the arguing that they did in the last film, I nonetheless felt sad because this film did a good job of selling their friendship. Like the last film, there's a lot of good humor with Obi-Wan. He has a lot of great one-liners. I especially like the moment when he comes across the droid general, Grievous, and says, Hello there as a nice reference to his first line in A New Hope. It's nice to see a character that started out as a lifeless robot turn into one of the best aspects of this trilogy. The story of this film is actually a compelling one. Anakin's transition from Jedi Knight to evil Sith Lord. While this still could have been executed much better, it nonetheless was a compelling concept. The opening scene of this film is definitely one of the best aspects. It's the first time that you actually feel like you're seeing a new Star Wars film. We have this amazing shot as we see Anakin and Obi-Wan's ships as they fly through the air, engaged in a ferocious battle with the droid army right above Coruscant. There's some good humor in here, some very interesting droid designs, some good lightsaber action, and a good finale where we see just how good a star pilot Anakin was as he lands what is left of General Grievous' ship on Coruscant. Now Anakin's transition to the dark side certainly starts off good. We see Palpatine's slowly manipulating him, telling Anakin that he wants him to be on the Jedi Council as his personal representative, only to have the Council tell him that they do not grant him the rank of Master. And instead of just bitching and moaning, Anakin acts angry, but still mature enough to sit down and accept it. But it still does anger him. Then Palpatine starts telling him that the ways of the dark side are more powerful than he may think, and that he could actually save his wife from dying. Unfortunately, this does go down hill later, but it was certainly a good start. The biggest issue that most people, myself included, have with this film is Anakin's transformation. The build-up certainly was good, but then once he turns, then BOOM! He's totally evil. Despite showing clear signs of humanity and not wanting to kill people in the first half, right after the confrontation with Mace Windu, he has absolutely no problem with killing every single Jedi, even the children. What the heck happened? 
I understand that he does want to save his wife and learn the ways of the dark side, but seriously, this is so cold-hearted and evil and it comes completely out of nowhere. Yes, the Jedi didn't give him the promotion that he wanted, but that's no reason to just go off killing them. Okay, so they attempted to kill this guy, Palpatine. Well, he's just admitted that he is in fact a Sith Lord, who most people know are the most evil people in the universe. One could argue that the reason why he does turn is somewhat because he feels like he's already crossed the line by helping kill Mace Windu. But here's the thing though, he wanted to protect Palpatine because he felt it wasn't the Jedi way. Now those are the signs of a person who values life and doesn't want to kill anybody. And while he certainly could have just blocked Mace Windu's blow instead of chopping his hand off, he still nonetheless didn't kill him. Palpatine did. And after seeing Palpatine murder somebody like that, I'm surprised he wouldn't just be like, look, I was just trying to protect you. I didn't want you to kill him. And yeah, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Betraying the Jedi, who have been the guardians of peace and justice for over a thousand generations, to this guy who just admitted that he's a Sith Lord, and he just got into power maybe 16 years ago? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that that guy is the person to trust. Anakin's character completely loses me at this point. Okay, so his wife is dying, but this guy could easily be full of crap by telling you that he could easily save her from dying. Does he really think that this guy is trustworthy? I get the idea that they were going for here. The fact that he cares about his wife so much that he's willing to do anything to save her. But A, Palpatine made little to no promise, and B, is it really worth killing all the Jedi who have done nothing other than attempt to kill people like Palpatine who are, well, evil, off? This movie went way too far in thinking how evil Darth Vader was. In the original trilogy, he was a bad guy, but did you really think to yourself, man, I bet that guy's so evil that he slaughtered children. No! That just turns him into a sick, mindless bastard. This change to the dark side is far too sudden, and just didn't work. A much better way to do this would have been to actually have Palpatine show Anakin that he could in fact bring something back from the dead. He could kill a small creature of some sort, and then use his powers to bring it back to life in front of Anakin, proving to him that you can in fact defeat death with the dark side. But that's not the only problem. Problem. Let's talk about Padme. In The Phantom Menace, Padme certainly wasn't a very interesting character. She was, well, a human computer, basically. But at least she was badass and took action. In this film, however, she just sucks. Her character does nothing but sit around and say terrible love dialogue. She's nothing more than a plot device, just something to get Anakin motivated to turn to the dark side. It's sad to see a character that started out strong and independent be totally degraded by the end of the trilogy. It was just leaked that apparently one of the original ideas for her character was that she starts forming the Rebel Alliance, which would have been a nice parallel as Anakin is forming the Empire. There were a couple of deleted scenes that actually showed this but unfortunately they were cut for some reason, taking away any remains of an interesting character found in Padme. Then originally, at the end of the film on Mustafar, she goes to Anakin attempting to kill him, but can't because she still loves him. But instead she goes to him and she just starts crying and becomes a totally pathetic mess. Whatever happened to that badass queen? I would like to see her please. Hell, her character is so stupid that even after hearing that Anakin has murdered children, she he still wants him to raise their child. What. The. Hell. Now let's talk about Palpatine. Now I have praised Ian McDermott's performance as the Emperor in the past. I thought he was amazing in Return of the Jedi, and even in The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, he was still good at playing a different side of the character. And throughout the first half of this film, he does a great job as well, as he slowly manipulates Anakin over to the dark side. He speaks very calmly, in a way that seems warm and welcoming, but at the same time threatening and mysterious. The scene in which he tells Anakin about the story of Darth Plagueis is one of the better scenes of the prequels. But then, when the moment that Mace Windu and the other Jedi come to arrest him, his character just plummets down. He becomes way too over the top and way too goofy. I never thought that I would see the day where I would be laughing my ass off at the Emperor, the guy who used to give me the chills. Anakin, I was right. The Jedi are taking over. No. 
No, no, you will die! I have the power to save the ones you love! Help me, Anakin! I am too weak! <laughs> His performance in this scene alone is, like, Razzy-worthy in how awful it is. Oh yeah, and his makeup after he gets scarred by his own lightning? Horrendous! This is like someone doing an over-exaggeration of the original Emperor. Throughout the rest of the film, I just laugh at his character. His fight with Yoda turns him into a giant pussy. Yoda force pushes him and he makes the most pathetic scream ever. Then Yoda blasts him back with his own force lightning, and again, he just acts like a total baby. I know some people will disagree with me. Hell, some people think that he's one of the best things in any of these prequel films. I certainly liked him before, but here he is just way too silly. We also have the new villain character, General Grievous. Now the design for this guy is great. He's like a half robot, half alien hybrid. You can see, especially when you look into his eyes, that there is something monstrous under there. I do wish that we could have seen it. And the idea of him having four arms with four lightsabers made him even more cool. Unfortunately though, his character is taken down a little bit by the fact that he coughs. Every couple seconds I keep expecting him to say to one of his droid cronies, oh, pass me my cough medicine. <coughs> And it's never explained why he is coughing. Now apparently there was a cartoon that came out before this film that actually explained why. Apparently Mace Windu crushed his chest plate, which gave him the cough. Okay, that's all fine and good, but what about the people who haven't seen the cartoon? Which, as a matter of fact, were the majority of people. Not a lot of people saw that cartoon, and they were totally confused. But that's not all. The writing for his character is very all over the place. At times he seems like a total badass, and at other times he just seems like a big coward. Mace Windu even says the line, General Grievous will run and hide like he always does. So he's a big coward and that's just his character, but he's somehow the general of the entire droid army? Seriously? Like Attack of the Clones, most of this film was done with CGI. And also, like Attack of the Clones, it really does show. There are still so many scenes that just feel like a bunch of real people in a CGI location. Some of the CGI does look good, like the opening space battles. That's some of the best CGI I've seen in any of these films. How's the action? Well, the opening scene, as I said before, is pretty exciting. Unfortunately though, we still have those stupid toothpicks again. And this movie is where they are at their absolute worst. The opening scene of this movie shows that they clearly are trying to play them more as comic relief here. It's like Lucas was fully aware of how pathetic they were, so he just decided to have fun with it. This movie has by far the most lightsaber battles of all the films, and unfortunately this does mean we will have a lot of mixed results. The first lightsaber duel with Count Dooku is cool. It's a lot more faster and fun than the one in the last film, and we do get to see a bit of Anakin starting to embrace his dark side. The fight with General Grievous is cool, but short. It lasts for only a couple minutes, although it still is very exciting as Obi-Wan chases him on top of a lizard as Grievous rides inside of a giant robotic hamster wheel, and Obi-Wan gets to kill him with a good old-fashioned blaster. I love the line, so uncivilized, that he says after he kills Grievous. The fight between Mace Windu and Palpatine is awful. It's slow and it's awkward, and the CGI double that they use for Ian McDermott is just atrocious. Ian McDermott, as usual, just makes these really silly and over-the-top faces that just make me laugh. The fight between him and Yoda might be my favorite in the film. It actually makes use of the Senate, one of the most boring locations in any of the Star Wars movies. It's like they were just thinking, well, you know what, Nobody seems to like these Senate meetings, so let's just put the Senate to good use. As we see Palpatine launching all the balconies at Yoda, and him dodging them and throwing them back at his face, we actually get to see Yoda use the Force again. He puts his lightsaber away, and just fights back with the good old Force. Though I'm still kind of annoyed that after simply getting blasted off of the balcony, Yoda just gives up just like that. Here's a simple way to fix this. After Palpatine blasts Yoda off the balcony, Yoda hits the ground and breaks his legs, which is why he uses a cane in the original trilogy, and it would have given him a much better reason for giving up. The final lightsaber battle between Anakin and Obi-Wan should have been very powerful and emotional, but unfortunately it is very choreographed. Entertaining, 
Yes, but as everybody has said, it just feels too much like a dance. When there is dialogue, it's pretty terrible. The moment leading up to the fight is supposed to be very emotional. There's this beautiful piece of music playing over it. Ewan McGregor is giving a really good performance, but Hayden Christensen as Anakin just ruins it. He goes back to being the whitey spoiled brat that he was in the last film. It's certainly cool the different places where they fight during the duel. They fight balancing on pipes. They even swing on ropes and clap in the air and they duel on floating pieces of machinery over lava and again when they do go back to talking it's just cringeworthy as Anakin says one of the dumbest lines of the series from my point of view the Jedi are evil the fight ends with Obi-Wan slicing Anakin's legs off and we have another very good scene as Obi-Wan shows Anakin just how sad he is that he's turned to the dark side and done the things that he's done and how awful it feels for him to have to do this though it still is very very very, very cruel of Obi-Wan to not just put Anakin out of his misery. I mean, I know Jedi shouldn't kill and blah blah blah, but what's really better? Killing them in a quick and painless way or leaving them to burn in agony. Speaking of emotion, this is by far the most emotionally powerful film of the prequels. The scene of Anakin making his decision in order to save Padme is a powerful scene because there's no dialogue. Instead of having endless scenes of him saying, I don't trust the Jedi Council anymore. We just have him sitting there and we see in his face the turmoil that he's going through. And while his turn to the dark side is still way too fast, this was a nice scene nonetheless. We also have the scene where the Jedi are killed off. Again, with little to no dialogue, they conveyed so much emotion. We see the Jedi's reactions to being betrayed by their own troops after a thousand generations of them being the guardians of peace and justice. They're now done for. It's these scenes that don't have any dialogue that are the most powerful ones. And when they do have dialogue, it often takes away from what could be a very emotionally powerful scene. The scene of Obi-Wan finding out that Anakin has turned to the dark side was just not that powerful because, well, it was too much talking. And unfortunately, his performance just didn't convey enough emotion to make me buy it. And then when he tells Padme about it, again, they couldn't just have him show her the security hologram of him killing all the younglings. Instead, they had to have him say it in this awkward and forced way. Jar Jar Binks is barely in this film at all. I mean, he's in a couple scenes for a few seconds and has maybe one line. Yeah. It's awesome. Even those stupid Trade Federation guys are killed off by Anakin, as if to say, yep, the fans don't like you and they won't miss you. Those last couple of scenes in the film are where the film shines the most and where the film suffers the most at the same time. The scene of Anakin becoming Darth Vader starts off fantastic. You have this great moment as his helmet is slowly lifted down, and he has a somewhat scared face as it's being lifted down as if he's starting to realize the machine that he's becoming, but knows that it's too late now. We hear a low and scary version of the Imperial March play, and then the all too familiar sound of Darth Vader breathing. He slowly rises up. A choir is playing in the background. The Emperor says, Lord Vader, can you hear me? And Vader says, yes, master. And we hear James Earl Jones's voice, Finally, he asks the Emperor where Padme is. The Emperor tells him that he killed her. He becomes angry. He breaks from his chains and then he says, No! And then all the great stuff that you saw before this with him becoming Darth Vader is just completely flushed down the drain. There's an interesting parallel because with the original trilogy, the Empire Strikes Back, I think, was the best, but Return of the Jedi had the most powerful scene with Darth Vader turning back to the good side. The prequels, on the other hand, I think Attack of the Clones was the worst one, but the scene of Darth Vader screaming, No! was by far the stupidest and most insulting scene in any of the films. It was as if to say, Oh, you think that because he's Darth Vader now that suddenly things are just gonna be awesome? Oh no, we're gonna destroy one of the greatest villains of all time in one moment. Oh yeah. For some fans, this scene just destroyed the entire film and I can't understand why. However, the scenes following it, I would actually say do somewhat redeem that scene. We finally get to see Alderaan, the planet that we never saw in the original trilogy. We see baby Princess Leia and we hear her theme again, and then we see the Lars farm on Tatooine and Luke being given to Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru by Obi-Wan. And we hear the iconic piece of music from the original trilogy, 
that played over the scene of Luke looking out to the twin sons. And it plays over this scene of Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru looking at the twin sons with baby Luke. In these small minutes, we are reminded of all those great moments in the original trilogy and why we see these movies and hold them so close to our hearts. If you want to find things to hate on with Revenge of the Sith, you'll definitely find them. There is still some really bad stuff in here, some of it the worst out of any of the Star Wars films, but there's also some really good stuff in here, some of it the best out of any of the Star Wars films. It's a really mixed bag, but in all honesty, I still do have a soft spot for this film. It's certainly the best of the Star Wars prequels, and I think it does have some of the stuff that made Star Wars so special. It's a film that I could definitely watch again in the future. Is it necessarily worthy of the Star Wars name? Well, I don't know. It still does have some cringeworthy stuff in here, but it also has some stuff to admire. It's not the original trilogy, but you know what? In a trilogy that started off with two really disappointing films, I think that this film definitely shines in that regard. I'd give Revenge of the Sith 6 out of 10. So that's my review of Revenge of the Sith, and to sum up my thoughts on the Star Wars prequels, they're disappointing movies, but they do still have some good in them. However, 10 years after Revenge of the Sith, we got another Star Wars movie. Did it restore the franchise to its former glory? Well, join me next time when I look at The Force Awakens. Till then, I'm Jack, and I will see you next time.